This is session three, chapter six. Two years before he and Terry had been fooling around down near the park, where the city seemed to end for a time and the trees grew thick and came down to the small river that went through the park. It was thick there and seemed kind of wild, and they had been joking and making things up and pretended that they were lost in the woods and talked in the afternoon about what they would do. Of course, they figured they'd have all sorts of goodies like a gun and a knife and fishing gear and matches so they could hunt and fish and have a fire. I wish you were here, Terry, he thought, with a gun and a knife and some matches. In the park that time, they decided that the best shelter was a lean-to, and Brian set out now to make one up. Maybe cover it with grass or leaves or sticks, he thought, and he started to go down to the lake again, where there were some willows that he could cut down for braces. But it struck him that he ought to find a good place for the lean-to, and so he decided to look around first. He wanted to stay near the lake because he thought of the plane. Even deep in the water might show up to somebody flying over, and he didn't want to diminish any chance that he might have of being found. His eyes fell upon the stone ridge to his left, and he thought at first he should build his shelter against the stone. But before that, he decided to check out the far side of the ridge, and that is where he got lucky. Using the sun and the fact that it rose in the east and set in the west, he decided that the far side was the northern side of the ridge. At one time in the far past, it had been scooped by something, probably a glacier, and this scooping had left a kind of a sideways bowl back in under a ledge. It wasn't very deep, it's not a cave, but it was smooth and made a perfect roof, and he could almost stand in it under the ledge. He had to hold his head slightly tipped forward at the front to keep it from hitting the top. Some of the rock that had been scooped out had also been pulverized by the glacial action turned into sand and now made a small sand beach that went down to the edge of the water in front and to the right of the overhang. It was his first good luck. No, he thought he had good luck in the landing, but this was good luck as well, luck he needed. All he had to do was wall off part of the bowl and leave an opening as a doorway and he would have a perfect shelter much stronger than a lean-to and dry because the overhang made a watertight roof. He crawled back in under the ledge and sat. The sand was cool here in the shade and the coolness felt wonderful to his face, which was already starting to blister and get especially painful on his forehead with the blisters on top of the swelling. He was also still weak. Just the walk around the back of the ridge and the slightly climb over the top had left his legs rubbery. It felt good to sit for a bit under the shade of the overhang in the cool sand. And now he thought, if I just had something to eat, anything. When he rested a bit, he went back down to the lake and drank a couple of drinks of water. He wasn't all that thirsty, but he thought the water might help to take the edge off his hunger. It didn't. Somehow the cold lake water actually made it worse, sharpened it. He thought of dragging in wood to make a wall on part of the overhang and picked up one piece to pull up, but his arms were too weak and he knew then it just wasn't the crash and injury to his body and head. It was also that he was weak from hunger. He would have to find something to eat. Before he did anything, he would have to have something to eat. But what? Brian leaned against the rock and stared out at the lake. What in all of this was there to eat? He was so used to having food just be there, just always being there. When he was hungry, he went to the icebox or to the store, or he sat down to his meal his mother cooked. Oh, he thought, remembering a meal now. Oh, it was last Thanksgiving, last year, the last Thanksgiving they had as a family before his mother demanded the divorce and his father moved out the following January. Brian already knew the secret, but did not know it would cause him to break up and thought it might work out. The secret his father still did not know, but he would try to tell it when he saw him. The meal had been turkey, and they cooked it in the backyard in the barbecue over charcoal with the lid down tight. His father had put hickory chips on the charcoal, and the smell of cooking turkey and the hickory smoke had filled the yard. 
When his father took the lid off, smiling, the smell that had come out was unbelievable. And when they sat to eat, the meat was wet with juice and rich and had the taste of the smoke in it. He had to stop this. His mouth was full of saliva and his stomach was twisting and growling. What was there to eat? What had he read or seen that told him about food in the wilderness? Hadn't there been something? A show, yes, a show on television about Air Force pilots and some kind of course they took. Survival course. All right, he had the show coming into his thoughts now. The pilots had to live in the desert. They put him in the desert down in Arizona or someplace, and they had to live for a week. They had to find food and water for a week. For water, they made a sheet of plastic into a dew-gathering device, and for food, they ate lizards. That was it. Of course, Brian had lots of water, and there weren't too many lizards in the Canadian woods that he knew. One of the pilots used a watch crystal as a magnifying glass to focus the sun and start a fire so they didn't have to eat the lizards raw. But Brian had a digital watch without a crystal and broken at that, so the show didn't help him much. No, wait, there was one thing. One of the pilots, a woman, had found some kind of beans on a bush and she used them with her lizard meat to make a little stew in a tin can that she found. Bean lizard stew. There weren't any beans here, but there must be berries. There had to be berry bushes around. That's what everybody always said. Well, he'd actually never heard anybody say it, but he felt that it could, should be true. There must be berry bushes. He stood and moved out into the sand and looked at the sun. It was still high. He didn't know what time it must be. At home, it would be one or two if the sun were that high. At home, at one or two, his mother would be putting away the lunch dishes and getting ready for her exercise class. No, that would have been yesterday. Today, she would be going to see him. Today was Thursday, and she always went to see him on Thursdays. Wednesday was exercise class, and Thursday, she went to see him. Hot little jets of hate worked into his thoughts and pushed once and moved back. If his mother hadn't begun to see him and forced the divorce, Brian wouldn't be here now. He shook his head. He had to stop that kind of thinking. The sun was high, and that meant that he had some time before darkness to find berries. He didn't want to be away from his. He almost thought of it as home, his shelter, when it came to be dark. He didn't want to be anywhere in the woods when it came to dark. And he didn't want to get lost, which was a real problem. All he knew in the world was the lake in front of him and the hill at his back and the ridge. If he lost sight of them, there was a really good chance that he'd get turned around and not find his way back. So he had to look for berry bushes, but keep the lake on or the rock ridge in sight at all times. He looked up the lake shore to the north. For a good distance, perhaps 200 yards, it was fairly clear. There were tall pines, the kind with no limbs, until the very close to the top, with a gentle breeze sighing in them, but not too much low brush. 200 yards up, there seemed to be a belt of thick lower brush starting, about 10 or 12 feet high, and that formed a wall he could not see through. It seemed to go on around the lake, thick and lushly green, but he could not be sure. If there were berries, there would be in that brush, he felt, and as long as he stayed close to the lake, so he could keep the water on his right and know it was there, he wouldn't get lost. When he was done or found berries, he thought he'd turn around so the water was on his left and walk back until he came to the ridge and his shelter. Simple. Keep it simple. I am Brian Robeson. I have been in a plane crash. I'm going to find some food. I'm going to find some berries. He walked slowly still a bit pained in his joints and weak from hunger, up along the side of the lake. The trees were full of birds singing ahead of him in the sun. Some he knew, some he didn't. He saw a robin and some kind of sparrows and a flock of reddish-orange birds with thick beaks. Twenty or thirty of them were sitting in one of the pines. They made much noise and flew away ahead of him when he walked under the tree. He watched them fly, their color a bright slash in solid green, and in this way he found the berries. The birds landed in some taller willow type of undergrowth with wide leaves and started jumping and making noise. 
At first, he was too far away to see what they were doing, but their colors drew him and he moved toward them, keeping the lake in sight on his right. And when he got closer, he saw that they were eating berries. He could not believe it was that easy, if it was as if the birds had taken him right to the berries. The slender branches went up about 20 feet and were heavy, drooping with clusters of bright red berries. They were half as big as grapes, but hung in bunches, much like grapes, and when Brian saw them glistening red in the sunlight, he almost yelled. His pace quickened, and he was in them in moments, scattering the birds, grabbing branches, ripping them to fill his mouth with berries. He almost spit them out. It wasn't that they were bitter so much as they lacked any sweetness and had a tart flavor that left his mouth feeling dry. And they were like cherries in that they had large pits, which made him hard to chew. But they were such a hunger on him, such an emptiness that he could not stop and he kept stripping the branches, eating berries by the handful, grabbing and jamming them into his mouth and swallowing them, pits and all. He could not stop, and then at last his stomach was full. He was still hungry. Two days without food must have shrunken his stomach, but the drive of hunger was still there. Thinking of the birds and how they would come back into the berries when he left, he made a carrying pouch of his torn windbreaker, and he kept picking. Finally, when he judged he had close to four pounds in his jacket, he stopped and went back to his camp by the ridge. Now, he thought, now I have some food and I can do something about fixing this place up. He glanced at the sun and saw he had some time before dark. If only I had matches, he thought, looking ruefully at the beach and lakeside. There was driftwood everywhere, not to mention dead and dry wood all over the hill and dead dry branches hanging from every tree. All firewood and no matches. How did they use to do it, he thought. Rub two sticks together? He tucked the berries in the pouch back in under the overhang in the cool shade and found a couple of sticks. After 10 minutes of rubbing, he felt the sticks and they were almost cool to the touch. Not that, he thought. They didn't do fire that way. He threw the sticks down in disgust, so no fire. But he could still fix the shelter and make it hear the word safer come into his mind, and he didn't know why. More livable. Kind of close it in, he thought. I'll close it in a bit. He started dragging sticks up from the lake and pulling long dead branches down from the hill, never getting out of sight of the water in the ridge. With these, he interlaced and wove a wall across the opening of the front of the rock. It took over two hours and he had to stop several times because he still felt weak and once because he felt strange new twinge in his stomach, a tightening, a rolling. Too many berries, he thought. I ate too many of them. But it was gone soon, and he kept working until the entire front of the overhang was covered, save for a small opening at the right end near the lake. The doorway was about three feet, and when he went in, he found himself in a room almost 15 feet long and eight to 10 feet deep, with the rock wall sloping down at the rear. Good, he said, nodding. Good. Outside, the sun was going down, finally, and in the initial coolness, the mosquitoes came out again and clouded on him. They were thick and terrible, if not quite as bad as in the morning, and he kept brushing them off with his arms until he couldn't stand it, and then he dumped the berries and put the torn windbreaker on. At least the sleeves covered his arms. Wrapped in the jacket with darkness coming down, he crawled back in under the rock and huddled and tried to sleep. He was deeply tired and still aching some. But sleep was slow coming and did not finally settle in till the evening cool turned to night cool and the mosquitoes slowed. Then at last, with his stomach turning on the berries, Brian went to sleep. Chapter 7 Mother He screamed it and he could not be sure if the scream awakened him or the pain in his stomach. His whole abdomen was torn with great rolling jolts of pain pain that doubled him in the darkness of the little shelter and put him face down in the sand to moan again and again. Mother, mother. Never anything like this. Never. It was all as if the berries and all the pits had exploded in the center of him, ripped and tore at him. He crawled out the doorway and was sick in the sand and then crawled still further and was sick again, vomiting and with terrible diarrhea for over an hour. 
for over a year, he thought, until he was at last empty and drained of all strength. Then he crawled back into the shelter and fell again to the sand, but he could not sleep at first. He could do nothing except lie there, and his mind decided then to bring the memory up again. In the mall, every detail, his mother sitting in the station wagon with the man, and she'd leaned across and kissed him. Kissed the man with the short blonde hair, and it was not a friendly peck, but a kiss. A kiss where she turned her head at an angle and put her mouth against the mouth of the blonde man, who was not his father, and kissed mouth to mouth, and then brought her hand up to touch his cheek and his forehead while they were kissing. And Brian saw it. Saw this thing his mother did with the blonde man. Saw the kiss that became the secret that his father still did not know about, know all about. The memory was so real that he, he could feel the heat in the mall that day. He could remember the worry that Terry would turn and see his mother. Could remember the worry of the shame of it, and then the memory faded, and he slept again. Awake. For a second, perhaps two, he did not know where he was, was still in his sleep somewhere, and then he saw the sun streaming in the open doorway of the shelter and heard the close, vicious whine of the mosquitoes and knew. He brushed his face, completely welded now with two days of bites, completely covered with lumps and bites, and was surprised to find the swelling on his forehead had gone down a great deal and was almost gone. The smell was awful and he couldn't place it. And then he saw the pile of berries at the back of the shelter and remembered the night and being sick. Too many of them, he said aloud, too many gut cherries. He crawled out of the shelter and found where he'd messed in the sand. He used sticks and cleaned it as best as he could and covered it with clean sand and went down to the lake to wash his hands and get a drink. It was still very early, only just past dawn and the water was so calm that he could see his reflection. It frightened him. His face was cut and bleeding, swollen and lumpy. The hair all matted, and on his forehead a cut had healed, but left the hair stuck with blood and a scab. His eyes were slits in the bites, and he was somehow covered with dirt. He slapped the water with his hand to destroy the mirror. Ugly, he thought, very ugly. And he was, at that moment, almost overcome with self-pity. He was dirty, starving, and bitten and hurt, and lonely and ugly and afraid, and so completely miserable that it was like being in a pit, a dark, deep pit with no way out. He sat back on the bank and fought crying, then let it come, and he cried for perhaps three or four minutes. Long tears, self-pity tears, wasted tears. He stood and went back to the water and took small drinks. As soon as the cold water hit his stomach, he felt the hunger sharpen as it had before, and he stood and held his abdomen till the hunger cramps receded. He had to eat. He was weak with it again, down with hunger, and he had to eat. Back at the shelter, the berries lay in a pile where he had dumped them when he grabbed his windbreaker. Gut cherries, he called them in his mind now, and he thought of eating some of them. Not such a crazy amount as which he felt brought on the sickness in the night, just enough to stave off hunger a bit. He crawled into the shelter. Some flies were on the berries and he brushed them off. He selected only the berries that were solidly ripe, not the light red ones, but the berries that were dark, maroon, red to black, and swollen in ripeness. When he had a small handful of them, he went down to the lake and washed them in the water. Small fish scattered away when he splashed the water, and he wished he had a fishing line and a hook. And then he ate them carefully, spitting out the pits. They were still tart, but had a sweetness to them, although they seemed to make his lips a bit numb. When he finished, he was still hungry, but the edge was gone, and his legs didn't feel as weak as they had. He went back to the shelter. It took him half an hour to go through the rest of the berries and sort them, putting all the fully ripe ones in one pile on some leaves and the rest in another pile. When he was done, he covered the two piles with grass that he tore from the lake shore to keep the flies off and went back outside. They were awful berries, those gut cherries, he thought, but there was food there, food of some kind, and he could eat a bit more later tonight if he had to. For now, he had a full day ahead of him. He looked at the sky through the trees and saw that while there were clouds, they were scattered and did not seem to hold rain. 
There was a light breeze that seemed to keep the mosquitoes down, and he thought looking up along the lake shore. If there was a kind of berry, there would be other kinds, sweeter kinds. If he kept the lake in sight as he'd done yesterday, he should be all right. He should be able to find home again, and it stopped him. He actually thought of it this time. Home. Three days. No two. Or was it three? Yes, this was the third day, and he thought of the shelter as home. He turned and looked at it and studied the crude work. The brush made a fair wall, not weather tight, but it cut most of the wind off. He hadn't done so badly at that. Maybe it wasn't much, but also maybe it was all he had for a home. All right, he thought, so I'll call it home. He turned back and set off by the side of the lake, heading for the gut cherry bushes, his windbreaker bag in his hand. They were bad, he thought, but maybe not that bad. Maybe he could find some better berries. When he came to the gut cherry bushes, he paused. The branches were empty of birds, but still had many berries, and some that had been merely red yesterday or now dark maroon to black, much riper. Maybe he should stay and pick them to save them. But the explosion in the night was still much in his memory, and he decided to go on. Gut cherries were food, but tricky to eat. He needed something better. Another hundred yards up the shore, there was a place where the wind had torn another path. There must have been fierce winds, he thought, to tear up places like this as they had the path he had found with the plane when he crashed. Here the trees were not all the way down, but twisted and snapped off halfway up from the ground, so their tops were down and rotted and gone, leaving the snags poking into the sky like broken teeth. It made for tons of dead and dry wood, and he wished more he could get a fire going. It also made a kind of a clearing. With the tops of the trees gone, the sun would get down to the ground, and it was filled with small thorny bushes that were covered with berries, raspberries. These he knew because there were some raspberry bushes in the park and he and Terry were always picking and eating them when they biked past. The berries were full and ripe and he tasted one to find it sweet with none of the problems of the gut cherries. Although they did not grow in clusters, there were many of them and they were easy to pick and Brian smiled and started eating. Sweet juice, he thought. Oh, they were sweet with just a tiny tang, and he picked and ate and picked and ate and thought he'd never tasted anything this good. Soon as before, his stomach was full, but now he had some sense and he did not gorge or cram some more down. Instead, he picked more and put them in his windbreaker, feeling the morning sun on his back and thinking he was rich, rich with food. Now, just rich, and he heard a noise to his rear, a slight noise, and he turned and saw a bear. He could do nothing and think nothing. His tongue stained with berry juice stuck to the roof of his mouth, and he stared at the bear. It was black with a cinnamon-colored nose, not 20 feet from him, and big. No, huge. It was all black fur and huge. He had seen one in a zoo in the city once a black bear, but it had been from India or somewhere. This one was wild and much bigger than the one in the zoo, and it was right there, right there. The sun caught the ends of the hairs along its back. Shining black and silky, the bear stood on his hind legs, half up, and studied Brian, and just studied him, then lowered himself and moved slowly to the left, eating berries as it rolled along wuffling and delicately using its mouth to lift each stem, each berry from the stem, and in seconds, it was gone. Gone, and Brian still had not moved. His tongue was stuck to the top of his mouth and the tip half out. His eyes were wide and his hands were reaching for a berry. And then he made a sound, a low. <clears throat> it made no sense. It was just a sound of fear, of disbelief that something that large could have come so close to him without his knowing. It just walked up to him and could have eaten him and he would have had done nothing, nothing. And when the sound was half done, a thing happened to his legs, a thing he had nothing to do with and they were running in the opposite direction from the bear back toward the shelter. He would have run all the way in panic, but after he was gone perhaps 50 yards, his brain took over and slowed and finally stopped him. If the bear had wanted you, his brain said, he would have taken you. 
It's something to understand, he thought, not something to run away from. The bear was eating ba berries, not people. The bear made no move to hurt you, to threaten you. It stood to see you better, to study you, and then it went on its way eating berries. It was a big bear, but it did not want you, did not want to cause you harm, and that is the thing to understand here. He turned and looked back at the stand of raspberries. The bear was gone. The birds were singing. He saw nothing that could hurt him. There was no danger here that he could sense or could feel. In the city at night, there was sometimes danger. You could not be in the park at night after dark because of the danger. But here the bear had looked at him, moved on, and this filled his thoughts. And the berries were so good. So good, so sweet and rich, and his body was so empty. And the bear had almost indicated that it didn't mind sharing, and it just walked away from him. And the berries were so good. And he thought, finally, if he did not go back and get the berries, he would have to eat the gut cherries again tonight. That convinced him, and he walked slowly back to the raspberry patch and continued picking for the entire morning, although with great caution. And once when a squirrel rustled some pine needles at the base of a tree, he nearly jumped out of his skin. About noon, the sun was almost straight overhead. The clouds began to thicken and look dark. In moments, it started to rain, and he took what he had picked and trotted back to the shelter. He had eaten probably two pounds of raspberries and maybe another three pounds in his jacket rolled in a pouch. He made it to the shelter just as the clouds completely opened and the rain poured down in sheets. Soon the sand outside was drenched and there were rivulets running down to the lake, but inside he was dry and snug. He started to put the picked cherries back in a sorted pile with the gut cherries, but noticed that the raspberries were seeping through his jacket. They were much softer than the gut cherries and apparently were being crushed a bit with their own weight. When he held the jacket up and looked beneath it, he saw a stream of red liquid. He put a finger in it and found it to be sweet and tangy, like pop without the fizz. And he grinned and lay back on the sand, holding the bag up over his face and letting the seepage drip into his mouth. Outside, the rain poured down, but Brian lay back, drinking syrup from the berries, dry and with the pain almost gone, the stiffness also gone, his belly full and a good taste in his mouth. For the first time since the crash, he was not thinking of himself or his own life. Brian was wondering if the bear was as surprised as he to find another being in the berries. Later in the afternoon, as evening came down, he went to the lake and washed the sticky berry juice from his face and hands. Then he went back to prepare for the night. While he accepted and understood that the bear did not want to hurt him, it was still much in his thoughts, and as darkness came into the shelter, he took the hatchet out of his belt and put it by his head, his hand on the handle, as the day caught up with him, and he slept.